Okay, in this video, we'll be continuing the pigeonhole principle. We'll be talking about the handshake problem and how we can use the pigeonhole principle to analyze it and come to its solution. So that's the problem statement. Prove that a party with at least two people, could be three, four, and there are at least two people who have shaken hands with the same number of people. Assume two people can only shake hands with each other zero or one times. So for me personally, when I read this, I get overloaded with hands, shaken, people, I mean, it's just what even is a handshake, so forth. So I like to just go through case by case with small amounts of n equals two and n equals three people to solidify my understanding. And then from there, try to abstract it. So we'll do that. So first off here, I've drawn it when n equals two people. Right, we have p1, p2. And there are really only two cases in a party with two people. Either they shake hands or they don't. And I want to start count, uh, counting this shaken hands. Um, so if P1 shakes P2 hands, then they each have shaken one hand. And so it's true, right? So it says there are at least two people who have shaken hands with the same number of people. Right, so P1 is shaking one hand, P2 is shaking hands with one hand, and that means that there's two people with the same number of shaking hands. Uh, and then the other case where they don't shake hands, and they both have zero, and again, it's true. We found a pair of people where their number of hands shaken is the same. So for n equals three people, I've already drawn out the four situations that could arise. Again, it's um, so for example, in this bubble, we could have drawn it P1 going to P3 or P1 going to P2, but really this is the case where just two people shake hands and the other one doesn't. So in this case, we have zero, one, one. And the statement is still true because we have one person or two people both have a one. In this case, they all shake hands with each other two and again the statement's true because at least two people in fact three of them all have the same number of hands shaken and then we have p1 so now we have two one one again the statement's true because we have two people that have the same number of hands shaken and then finally where no one shakes each other's hands then we have um Again, the statement is true because we have at least two. In fact, we have three people. So I understand the problem a little bit better now. We have n equals two, n equals three. I could do the case for n equals four, but in general, we're going to want like a, an argument for um, a general n. I'm going to, just for clarity, say n equals five people. And you can generalize at the end. I'm not going to go through and draw all the diagrams out. There's, in fact, a lot. So that would be, uh, while it'd be fun to try to enumerate them all, it'd be a difficult challenge. So instead, I want to create an argument that you could generalize to a um, arbitrary n. So first off, we want to set up our, our x and y sets, because we are in the pigeonhole principles section. So and x is going to be people, and y is the number of handshakes. So we have one, two, three, four, five people. And actually, I'm going to label them P1 through P5. And then the number of handshakes. Well, this one's going to take a little bit of thought of like what the, the numbers are here. But we could have the case where there's zero handshakes. Right? Like someone, person one could have zero handshakes. That's possible. Obviously, you know, we have one, uh, two, three, four. And you may think that may as well just go up to five as well. But it turns out that if you have five people, the maximum number of handshakes that could occur for any single person is going to be four. 
In fact, it's always going to be one less. Um, try to convince you of that right here. We have n equals three people. But in a maximum setting, it's two, two, and two. Uh, we also have n equals two people here. And then the maximum setting, we have one and one. And I'll even draw out the n equals four situation. So let's say we had four people. The maximum situation would be they all shake hands with each other. And then each person here has shaken three hands. So the maximum number of handshakes with n people would be n minus one. And for five, it would be four. So those are our two sets. Okay. And we want to somehow argue that it's not possible or that there's going to be um, at least two people that have the same number of handshakes. But you may be thinking, well, here's an element of five sets, right? This is size of x here equals five and the size of y equals five. So you may be thinking that there's nothing wrong with that. Like, why can't we just have P1 go to zero, P2 go to one, and so forth. And the subtlety is um, if we do have someone that decides to opt out. So P1. Decides to opt out. Then f of p1 equals zero. Okay. Then something I wouldn't say strange, but with a little bit of thinking, you'll you can convince yourself that four it will no longer be obtainable. What do I mean by that? In a situation where someone opts out like this one right here the max remember with n equals two the max equals sorry when n equals three people the max handshakes is two but if someone opts out then that means person two and person three can no longer get the maximum handshakes because one there's one less person for them to uh, shake hands with same thing with um Let's do a case with n equals four. So we have four people. Let's say P1 decides to opt out. Then the most anyone else can get is two. So remember with n equals four, the max is supposed to be three. But when someone opts out, the max then gets reduced to two. And that's how we're going to argue here. So if f of p1 equals zero, so if p1 decides to opt out, then the other four people have one less person to shake hands with. In other words, f of p j will be less than or equal to three for j equals two, three, four, and five. All right, these are the four other people. All right, p one or sorry, p two. P3, P4, P5, and I'm just saying that F of those people, if I try to map them out, it's not going to be possible. None of them can do that. That's a no-go because someone opted out. So there's one less person for them to shake hands with. Uh, so how's the pigeonhole principle come into play here then? Well, we have a set of four people left, P2. P3, P4, P5, 
be five, four people. And the number of handshakes that they can try to go grab are just these three left, one, two, and three. So by the pigeonhole principle, there exists, remember this is, a, well, there exists a number of handshakes that have at least two people. So we have a four person set trying to be mapped to a three person or three handshake set. And so at least one of these has to have two people. All right, so P2 maybe goes to one, P3 tries to go to two, P4 goes to three, and then you're stuck. P5 still needs to be mapped to one of these that already has a person there. All right. Um, so that's the that's case one where P1 decides to opt out. So I'll go back here, case one. Case two, let's say everyone or no one decides to opt out. So we have P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. We have zero, one, two, three, four. Well, so zero is no longer an option for any of them because no one decided to opt out. And so now again, we have this five person set getting mapped to a four element set. And so by pigeonhole principle, at least one of the five people, or sorry, at least one of the number of handshakes We'll have two people, All right? Because these are our objects, and these are our boxes. And I have four boxes here, five objects. If I try to place those five objects into those four boxes, at least one of the boxes, the number of handshakes, will have two objects, the two people. And that's really the end of proof for n equals five. And, um, you know, exercise. Uh, try for arbitrary n. So maybe, you know, fix a number, try n equals 10. The argument is very similar. You just have a little bit more to write. Or you have um, just a n, no value attached to it and try to go through and recreate this proof. And I think it'll be a good exercise for you. All right, we have one more pigeonhole principle video to go. It'll be a more of a challenging one that will force us to use the set function um, framework. See you in the next video.